Hello everyone and welcome to APM's annual general meeting. I'm Matthew Johnson, APM's communications manager. I'll be supporting on today's meeting. Thank you very much for joining us today. Just a polite reminder to all attendees to please place your microphones on mute to avoid any unwanted background noise. There will be dedicated points in the agenda for questions and we certainly invite you to submit any questions you may have on today's proceedings using the chat bar. We will try to answer as many as we can in the time that we have. Also to make everyone aware, we are recording today's meeting as well. But it's now 10.30, so without further ado, I'll hand over to our chair for today, APM President Sue Kershaw. Lovely, thank you very much, Matthew, and welcome to everyone on the call. Um, it's so good to be able to reach out to so many people at the same time. Um, it's fantastic. So just a, a few points of admin, if I may, before we kick off. Um, as ever, we expect courteous behaviour, so do ask your questions in the way you would like to be asked those questions. Um, the session will be recorded, as you can see the red button on the, on the left, and it will be posted online afterwards. Papers for the event are on the web page, but also in the chat. If you see on the right hand side there, there are all the papers, the agenda, the full annual report, uh, draft charter changes and members annual review. So they're all there for your use. Um, attendees will be muted, so please remain muted unless invited to speak and the same for cameras as well, so we don't overload the system. And timings wise, we should be finished um, by about 11.30 and only full and fellow members are eligible to vote. So now if I may introduce the team, firstly Mila Mazulu, board chair. You can put your camera on Mila. Hi everyone. Hey. Hey. Okay. Hi, hi. Yes, we can indeed, thank you. Okay. And next, Good morning. Um, next, Adam Bodison, Chief Exec. Good morning. And Mike Robinson, Company Secretary. Good morning. Good morning, Mike. Uh, Mark Hepworth, Deputy Chief Executive. Good morning. Good morning. And we have the wider leadership team online as well, just in case we need some help. So I'll hand over now to Mike, if I may, um, for apologies of absence. Thank you very much, Sue. Just two apologies to read out today. I've received them from Graham Godding and Peter O'Dowd. Thank you. Brilliant. Right, so now I'm just going to um, say a few words, if I may, to put things in context and um, from my view as well. So it's a real privilege uh, for me to give the presidential address, and this is my third one so far. And of course, AGMs are a really important part of governance of any membership body. Members are not just customers. You have a key role to play in our governance, and that can be seen on the agenda today. And to be honest, without all your hard work and dedication, the AGM wouldn't be what it is today. The APM is accountable to you, and today we report our progress and plans. We affirm the new trustees you've elected, and we ask for your approval to the update of the Royal Charter. We are holding our AGM virtually for the second time, and this gives us the opportunity, as I said, to reach out to so many more people. I was delighted to hear the number of registrations has reached a new high, and the feedback from one member, an overseas member of more than 40 years, who said he appreciated the online approach and was looking forward to now taking part in the AGM. This will be our second AGM too, with Adam Bodison as our chief exec. I said last year how I was struck by his enthusiasm. He hasn't let me down this year. It's as strong as ever, Adam. And you're out there all over the country meeting our supporting members and advancing the cause of project management with many, many different organisations. It's also our first AGM with Mila Mazulu as chair of the board. And I'm delighted to welcome her to that position. Mila has a wealth of talents and will help drive us forward. I know she has been a value trustee and has considerable experience in our profession and the rail sector. She has been a valued volunteer and I was delighted to hear that she received the British Empire Medal earlier this year. Fantastic news, Miller. I'm confident Miller will be able to fill the big shoes left by Debbie Lewis, our outgoing chair. Debbie has provided truly excellent leadership and we're very grateful to her. She remains a close friend of APN and I'm pleased she will remain involved in the board's committees. You'll hear in a minute from Miller and Adam 
on their reporting accounts and indeed the achievements and milestones we achieved in our previous business year, which will be set out in the upcoming APM members review. But I would like to mention three areas that I'm really proud of that we're making progress. First and most obvious is the new brand. You can see in some of the backdrops people have, it was launched at the end of October. It still feels new, but looks absolutely fantastic. My thanks go to everyone who worked on that launch. I know it's a huge undertaking and it's so good to do it in APM's 50th year. And on the 50th anniversary, we saw celebrations across the full breadth of the APM community. We all did so much to promote project management through those celebrations, including publishing our list of 50 inspiring projects, which were printed online and in a new memorial book. A media campaign saw that APM gain coverage on this in several national newspapers and created a new exciting suite of content for the APM's website, social media accounts and our face to face events. And of course, we launched our new strategy. This was another huge undertaking because we had to ensure we got it right. And I think it's safe to say that so far we have done just that. Membership numbers are up again with 1700 new members bringing a total to 37,000. That's colossal. And we now have members in over 140 countries making us a truly international body. We've welcomed new honorary fellows from associated sectors like journalism and academia, building our reputation in those sectors. And to support members, we launched the major project leadership specialist certificate, quite catchy, um, delivered to a new mentoring scheme, and we also refreshed our competence framework. There's more to come next year as we properly begin to implement the new strategy. Next year, we'll focus on continuing to embed CHPP as expected global standard. This is important because when projects succeed, society benefits. I think it's important to recognise the incredible amount that has been achieved this year and how this sets us up for more of the same or even better in 2023. Over to Adam and Miller now to expand on this. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Just very briefly before we do go over to the annual report and accounts, um, could we just deal with the minutes of the last meeting? Certainly. Thank you, Mike. So we'd like to um, ask everyone gathered to approve these minutes of the meeting. Um, attendees can comment on chat or unmute if they have an issue, and if not, we'll take silence as approval. I think that's approval, Mike. Thank you. So over to, to Mila, I think, in the first instance. Thanks very much, Sue. Thank you, Mike. Um, and good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm so pleased. I'll just start off by saying how absolutely thrilled I am to see uh, so many of you who've dialed into this call. This must be an absolute record for an annual general meeting. Um, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, please um, uh, do engage with us uh, throughout this meeting. If you've got questions to ask, we'll take them ideally at the end of um, this particular session, but use the hands up feature um, to, uh, to let us know if you'd like to ask anything. I'll just start off uh, with a bit of a review of 2021 slash 2022, the last financial year, um, and I'll we'll move us uh, onto the uh, slide, which just identifies our organisational values. I thought it would be quite helpful to start with this so that you can all just get a refresh on what the organisation sets out to achieve and the way it sets out to behave. Um, the values are uh, for us to be progressive, thoughtful, warm and excellent. Um, and the slide here just shows you a few examples of what we mean by that as an organisation. I won't read through all of them. I'll just pause for a minute or so just while you just quickly scan through. The slides will be made available for you to review afterwards, so I would encourage you to read through these examples. But I'll next move on to um, just talking you through a little bit about our organisational structure and our governance structure. And on the next slide, you'll see our board of trustees. Uh, and I'm really, really pleased uh, to be able to work with the trustees for the next uh, sort of year or so um, on settling down and bedding in some of the wonderful projects that have just been launched this year, including our rebrand. 
of course, as we all know, the whole purpose of the association is to help the project profession deliver better. And on the next slide, what you'll see are a few of our uh, uh, key sort of unique selling points as an organization. We're a chartered organization and we're here to build the profession's profile and set the standards for the profession. We're the only chartered membership organization for the profession in the whole world um, and we're a registered charity. Our activities are very broad, um, but uh, we do work on uh, sharing best practice, leading debate, um, but we're more than just process focus. Uh, we want to challenge the status quo and champion innovation and and uh, and, and clever thinking. We want to help the project profession deliver better because when we do that and when projects succeed, the whole of society benefits. What we've done this year is we've also worked on refreshing our strategic framework in line with these values and this uh, um, uh, vision. Uh, and you see here a summary of the uh, structure that we're following for this. And at the top, you'll see that our vision is of a world in which all projects succeed which is supported by the mission and the charitable objectives for the organisation, which are to advance the science, theory and practice of project and programme management for public benefit. This is underpinned by the four values that I mentioned previously and some strategic themes that we've aligned to that. But of course, our mission and our vision are what drives us forward. Our next slide will just show you that. Our mission is to advance the science, theory and practice of project and programme management for the public benefit so that we can end up in a world where all projects bring ultimate success. The next few slides will show you a little bit of our journey um, over the uh, past few years and some of the some of the things that we're really, really targeting at the moment. We really want to leverage the chartered status. We want to raise the standards and increase membership. We also want to have the right partnerships in place so that we can benefit and share risk as part of an overall ecosystem. We want to be a progressive organisation, collaborating and providing insight and also being adaptive. On the next slide, you'll see um, our targets for being a professional body that supports all project professionals, recognising that professionals do a range of roles uh, within a project and making sure that our community has a relevant range of offerings that aren't single points. We also identify and enable the right skills for the project professional and the next slide will start to take you through those. How we use technology to evolve learning, how we have adaptive project professionals that get support in this fairly volatile and uncertain world that we're in. We want to enable sustainability and we want to in, across all projects and we want to support all types and all stages of, uh, of career in the project management profession. The APM is an outstanding professional body and the next slide will take you through how we seek to achieve that. And that's by ensuring the right skills and experiences are available for the organisation, that we have highly engaged people either working or volunteering for the APM. We want to be a benchmark of a professional body and assure successful strategy delivery. A couple of our successes uh, have already been picked out by Sue in her speech, and I'd encourage you to read more about them. The next slide tells you a little bit about the uh, APM Major Project Leadership Specialist Certificate, which is an assessment that's been designed to recognise the skills and competence of those who lead either major projects, programmes or portfolios. We also have a very strong community focus to the APM, and the next slide shows you a little bit about that. Alongside our APM uh, branches and specific interest group communities, we have the APM community platform, which is exclusively av available to our members. This has been created so that there is a safe and welcoming environment for our members to support each other, to find a mentor and to work together so that they can realise their potential. I would really, really warmly encourage you to let us know if there's any um, of our volunteering opportunities that you'd like to be involved in. I'll just now uh, take a pause. Thank you for your time and I'll pass you over to Adam who will take you through a review of 21 slash 22 from his perspective as Chief Executive Officer. Thanks very much Miller. Uh, next slide please. So we've already heard from Sue about the uh, fabulous increase in membership uh, over the last financial year uh, and, and I'm pleased to say that that increase has continued into the current year too which is great. 
Uh, in terms of chartership, we expanded the list of recognised assessments that count towards CHPP applications, and that included the University of Cumbria, as well as Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen, the latter of which actually became the first university in Scotland to be recognised as a route to chartered status, which is obviously fabulous. Um, in terms of knowledge and research, it was a very strong year for us. Uh, we had a number of key publications that extended our knowledge and really helped us to engage with audiences globally. Uh, and also our APM Research Fund received one of its highest number of submissions uh, to date, which is, which is fantastic. In terms of the um, uh, key research reports, you'll see on the screen here, we've got the Dynamic Conditions for Project Success, which was um, probably one of the most significant reports uh, of the year for several reasons, partly because it, it, it led directly into the updated uh, third edition of the competence framework. Um, and now that process itself involved a year long consultation to gain views from across the profession and updating existing com uh, competencies. But, but as a direct result of the dynamic conditions for project success research, we also included two new competencies, one around sustainability and another around diversity and inclusion. And actually the updated edition of that framework was accompanied by the launch of an online self-assessment tool which allows users to benchmark and save uh, progress at their own pace, which is excellent. We also obviously launched our mentoring programme, something which members had been asking for. And by the end of the financial year, we had 179 active mentors in place and 70 uh, working mentoring pairs. And, and again, that's continued to grow into the next financial year too. And then just on hybrid, of course, which is this new world that we're all operating in at the moment, uh, the 2021 APM Project Management uh, Awards was our first ever hybrid event. Um, and we had attendees joining both in person, and of course, online. And it was the first time that we streamed across four platforms. So Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn, as well as our own website. And we had twice as many people actually watching the streamed version of the event as there were in person. So really very successful. Uh, next slide, please. As has been mentioned, uh, our 50th anniversary, um, and Sue mentioned earlier on the the uh, 50 impactful projects from the past 50 years that we we, we identified. Um, so really encourage you to have a look at that. Uh, the feedback's been very positive. But we also uh, updated the history book, which we produced on our 40th anniversary, to reflect the, uh, the 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 next 10 years of our of our journey. So that's a kind of digital living document. And again, for those who are interested in the history of the organisation, a really good thing to look at. Um, and then, of course, it was uh, the opportunity as well to refresh the strategy and look at the new brand. Uh, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> on the brand, it's just worth saying, although the, the, the new brand launched in October of this year, which is effectively the, the, the next financial year to the one we're reporting on. I think it's important to include it today because lots of the work, of course, that led to that did take place in the previous financial year too. And, uh, and, and really that's uh, come to fruition uh, this year. Uh, but the feedback that we've had on that in the, in the few weeks that that's been out there has been very positive and it's been very well received. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of uh, membership and satisfaction, um, we obviously get lots of data and feedback on membership from a range of sources. And you will know because of the complexity of the project profession that people will join uh, APM for very different reasons. So there is no surprise that there are significant motivational differences for, for becoming a member. But actually one of the common themes was that uh, that professional development was a key reason why lots of people had joined. Um, there are some challenges for us in terms of making sure that we maintain value for money in these challenging economic times and uh, that's something obviously we're actively looking at but despite that it's in, it's important to report that our rating as a professional body has actually improved with more than half of members likely to recommend APM membership and our net promoter score actually increasing as well to plus 37 so very positive indeed. Uh, in terms of, um, oh sorry, next slide please. Uh, in terms of uh, our portfolio team internally and the projects they've been working on, it's worth saying that I have sometimes talked about what I've called the big four this year. Um, so there are four projects that uh, many organisations would choose to do one of and it would be a big deal and we've done four at, at the same time. 
One was the rebrand. Uh, one is the uh, update to our CRM uh, and work on that continues. Uh, obviously our 50th anniversary celebrations and the refresh to our strategy. So it really has been a significant year in terms of uh, a project delivery for us as an organisation. We've also had a number of reviews and, and, and updates happening, uh, not least to the uh, the standards and uh, um, uh, standards and qualifications that we have and you can see here around chartership accreditation and, and the project management qualification and at the heart of those is to make sure that these qualifications and standards are inclusive accessible and aligned to each other and also uh, up to date and lastly there is the volunteer review there again work continues with that uh, into the new year as well um, and I repeat what I said at the volunteers forum I attended when I was three weeks into the role uh, last year which is that I really want this to be a golden era for our volunteer community and this review will significantly contribute towards that uh, next slide please uh, in terms of our public affairs and research, again, another busy year. Um, we've delivered nine new research reports. Um, obviously, we mentioned dynamic conditions for project success already, but others have included the understanding uh, agile, uh, getting started in project data, artificial intelligence in project management. Can artificial intelligence become a project manager? Sustainability in construction projects, the value of assurance, sustainability in social networks, and also fairness and unfairness in projects. All of those reports have enhanced our knowledge of the profession and of course are contributing to improving project delivery. But I think probably one of the step changes that we're trying to uh, make sure we have in this area is to make sure that we also focus increasingly on impact. And that's about ensuring that the recommendations and evidence that we get from this research and insights actually informs practice and policy. And we do that through a broad range of events with key stakeholder groups, um, and that includes corporate partners and of course, government departments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to reflect a bit more on volunteers, uh, in that last financial year, we had more than 700 volunteers in our volunteer community, and, and they spanned 15 different countries. Um, and 250 plus apprentice and graduate ambassadors supporting our outreach events. Uh, I mentioned earlier on about the 179 members involved in the, in the mentoring programme, uh, and we actually had more than 200 events that were delivered uh, with our volunteers, both in person and online. And lastly, just a, a reflection going forwards. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, on what the focus is going to be for the remainder uh, of the current year. So first of all, there's several things that we're going to continue. I mentioned the CRM uh, work. Obviously, that's a, a, a big project and to work on that will continue. We obviously want to continue to leverage our chartered status uh, and that's an ongoing piece of work too. And of course, the reviews that I mentioned uh, earlier as well. Uh, two points just to reflect on a, in a bit more detail. So first of all, collaboration in the spirit of one project profession. What I'm talking about here is that there are a number of uh, associations, both professional bodies, but also uh, private organisations as well that operate in and around the project profession. And I think our members and the project profession community expect us to collaborate and work together in that spirit of one profession. And that's very much the type of approach that we have had and will continue to have going forward is what, one of looking at how can we best collaborate with everybody else that's uh, playing in this space. And then lastly, what I'm calling 1, 10, 100. Um, and, and this is really um, to give some sense of how we set our sights for the future and what success looks like in the context of our refreshed strategy. Um, and the question I've been asking internally uh, and increasingly I'll be asking externally as well, is what would it take for us to become an organisation that has 1,000 uh, <clears throat> 1, corporate partners, 10,000 chartered project professionals and 100,000 members? And the reason I'm asking that question is because I want us to have an equivalent status to very established professional bodies. And when you look at those professional bodies, actually a lot of them have a profile which is not dissimilar to that. So that's very much uh, a key part of, of our journey. Um, so thank you for that. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Mark Hackworth, the Deputy CEO, who will lead us through the financial report. Great, thank you, Adam. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Uh, so like many other organisations, our operations continue to be impacted by COVID and the ongoing cycles of lockdown in 2021. However, the work we put in over the previous year in readying ourselves uh, for returning to more normal operations clearly had an impact. 
Our income increased by uh, 10% in the year and has continued to strengthen since. Uh, we generated uh, £11.2 million worth of revenue and through ongoing cost management reduced our operating deficit from £771,000 in 2021 to £122,000 in 2022. Our investments continu continue to improve leaving us with a net surplus of £189,000 compared to a net deficit of £114,000 the previous year. As a result, our funds increased to just over six and a half million at the end of the year. Next slide, please. Um, our two main sources of income, membership subscriptions and exams, both increased in the year uh, with qualifications particularly strong, growing by over 20%. We actually, actually delivered more exams last year than before the pandemic, a uh, total of some 17,000. Uh, publication was down little compared to the prior year as we'd launched the Body of Knowledge Box 7 in 2020. Um, whilst it's early days, we saw some recovery in our events income as we gradually eased into returning to face to face. Overall, income grew by a million pounds, which is a, a great achievement in difficult conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, and as our income increased, uh, the cost of every also grew, but, but at a lesser rate. Uh, our average headcount was slightly uh, lower than the previous year, uh, as we started to see some movement out in the last quarter, just reflecting uh, the, the national impact of the Great Resignation. That's since stabilised and we're currently running at full capacity. Uh, and as you've heard, uh, investments in new content also rose considerably. Uh, both this and our marketing and communication activities are, are directly designed to support the profession. Overall costs were around £400,000 more than the previous year, which is actually a little lower than the inflation figure at the end of March. Next slide, please. As both Sue and Adam have noted, uh, we ended the year with over 37,000 members, uh, an increase of 6% in the year. All categories grew or at least held pretty steady. Uh, and in the five years since March 2017, our membership base has increased by over 60%, uh, with a rise in every year. And I would say that's a, a good reflection of our ability to bring value to the profession. Next slide, please. And our balance sheet continues to remain strong. Uh, we've come through COVID with our net assets at pretty much the same level as they were in 2019. Our reserves remain well in the range uh, that the board requires us to hold. Uh, and that means that we've been able to focus our efforts on implementing the first steps in our strategic plan that uh, was launched in June and that Pant Miller uh, talked about earlier. Um, that's all from me. So do we have any questions on the report and accounts, Matt? There's nothing come through from the chat bar, Mike. OK, so well, in that case, we're ready to move to the next agenda item. I'll hand over to Mike then. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Next slide, please, Matt. Just want to uh, give you a little bit of background to the Royal Charter, which is, of course, a fantastic accolade for APM and for the profession. But just to explain, it's also our constitution. Um, it's on the website if you are interested in that and the regulations is in the about us section. I would encourage everyone to engage with our governance if, as necessary. Um, what we have done since we received the charter is continuously review and refresh whether it still meets our needs. So one of the things we would like to request this time because it is the annual general meeting is required to approve any suggested changes to the charter before we forward them to the Privy Council, is a change in relation to the composition of the board. So the background to this stems from an external board evaluation we had. We have uh, an evaluation of our own governance every year because that's, that's best practice and we want to keep on top of um, best practice and that operate in the most efficient way. Last year it was externally facilitated and the consult consultant suggested uh, that we review this section. Um, as you know, the majority of the board are elected by the membership from the membership and our next agenda item comes on to affirm those trustees who have got onto the board this year. Um, what the Charter also enables the board to do is appoint a small number of trustees directly. That's been taking place for a very long time. Three trustees are appointed. Um, what we'd like to do is increase that number to five. Diversity of thought is important for the board, and that would give the board the extra opportunity to appoint a limited number of additional trustees to the board if it sees gaps in its skills, experience or diversity. So there's a, um, a few bits on screen. The important bit is in the 
document A, which was circulated, um, and the special resolution that we'd like to agree is that in bylaw 16.3, we delete up to three individuals and replace it with up to five. So as I say, uh, giving the board the opportunity, if it so wishes, to slightly increase the number of appointed trustees. So I will pause at this point. I can't see any questions in the chat. I'm more than happy. I can, I can enable microphones if anyone has any queries, but uh, can I ask if, every, if anyone is unhappy with that? If not, I think it's safe to assume, Sue, that we have unanimity on the proposal and we could take it as read and approved. Thank you, Mark. It appears that everyone's happy with that. Yeah, I can only see. Oh, just received one comment. I do apologise. Um, a suggestion that we include an implementation date. That's out of our hands. It's a very good uh, question uh, um, for a project professional, of course. That's out of our hands. What we do once approved is that this goes forward to the Privy Council to approve. And once they have done so, which would likely to be early in the new year, we can implement that change. Yeah, I, I can only see positive comments coming in. So I think we conclude that item. Sue, if you're happy to move on. You're on mute, Sue, but I, I think I look ready, yes. I think it's back to you, Mike. Thank you. So next slide, please. And again, Matt. Thank you. So the, the next uh, honour is to present the results of the election. So um, as you know, you've all received, uh, all voting members have received an invitation to stand to be on the board and to vote for trustees who put themselves forward. This year, we've had another excellent turnout of candidates, uh, 10 really good, strong candidates, and the turnout on voting was 18.1. So uh, a very strong performance again. Next slide, please, Matt. So those results have come in and these those votes are delivered as proxy votes to this, this board, which affirms the appointments. So the results are on screen and I'm delighted to say Amy Morley was re-elected for a further three year term. Shalina Samani and Belle French are also welcome to the board as trustees for three year terms. Thank you. Excellent. Congratulations to all of those people. Uh, really, really good to see such a strong board. So we're now on um, agenda item six, which is members questions. And Matt, are there any written questions that have come in? There are. Thank you, Sue. I'll proceed through these. I believe that Adam has some answers prepared. Um, please let me know when you would like me to move on to the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, just you can go to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. OK, so um, uh, I'll try not to just repeat what's on the screen here, but just to paraphrase. But uh, uh, essentially, we had a question from Graham Godding, which was about uh, would we want to or could we highlight just two or three APM members that have the greatest influence on APM in its recent history? Uh, really challenging question uh, for us. Uh, and, and actually, we, 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 we don't think we could just highlight just two or three because there are so many people who have really helped APM to become the organisation that it is today. Um, what we did want to say, though, was that uh, the holders of APM's awards and, and fellowships can, of course, be justly proud of their achievements. And, and, and just to comment how delighted we are with the, the both the volume and breadth of the, the supporters and volunteers that we, we have right across the full breadth of our activity. Um, and I'd also just like to echo the fact that they're supported by by the team internally as well. And that shared passion between the kind of the staff and the volunteer community, I think, is, is a real strength for us going forwards. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we had two questions here, one from uh, Merv Wyeth and one from Tom Taylor, which were, were both around a similar theme. So I'm going to answer them both together. And essentially they were to do with uh, our plans to collaborate uh, with PMI uh, very specifically uh, and, and also generally uh, around other European um, and international organisations. Um, so I, 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 the approach that we want to take, as I said earlier on, is one based on collaboration. Um, and I just re-emphasise what I said earlier about the fact that we are one profession and the expectation that I think our members would have for us to engage with other organisations to make sure there is that jo joined up global approach. In terms of the two big project management organisations, IPMA and, and PMI, I just want to reflect brief, briefly on those. So first of all, uh, earlier this year, so September, I actually uh, went to address in person the IPMA Council of Delegates. 
and a, a key part of the message I delivered there was about APM's long term commitment to membership of IPMA and supporting uh, that, that, that global organisation, which of course we were a founding member of and will continue to be for many years to come, I hope. And, and similarly, um, I, I know that um, uh, our history with PMI has been bumpy on occasion, uh, but nevertheless, there is a shared ambition um, around this theme of us being one profession. And I, I can tell you that I, I'm regularly engaging with senior colleagues at PMI to look for opportunities for greater collaboration and alignment. So I suppose I'd say watch this space on that one, um, but uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's positive. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, the final written question we had here was uh, again from Tom Taylor, and this one was to do with the volume of uh, uh, emails. Actually, there are two more questions, apologies. This one was to do with volume of emails, and, and Tom was saying he's getting an ever increasing number of emails every single day. Um, and what is our policy uh, on issuing such material to members and any advice on this matter? So uh, this is an area we've actively been looking at because we want to make sure that everybody receiving our emails is getting the news and information they actually need at the right time and the right volumes. So the feedback is helpful. Um, uh, one thing uh, I would say is that we, we most of the things that we sent out are sent out monthly, but what we do is, is give the choice of what members receive uh, up to those individual members. So apologies, Tom, that you've been getting more than you need, but whether it's Tom or anybody else, if you log into the website using your uh, APM uh, details, you, you can actually update your preferences on there about what you want to receive and what you don't want to receive and, and how often. Um, we have also found that some people receive duplicates because they've registered multiple emails with us, and that can sometimes mean you get emails more than once. And again, that's something we can sort out if that's if that's happening to you. Uh, the only final thing I'd just say on this is that it's an area we, as I say, we have been looking at independently of, of receiving the feedback. And what we uh, have found out is that um, uh, people are members are largely positive uh, about the volume and emails, and we've actually tried to reduce the number of emails. Uh, over the past year, and that's led to an increase in the open rates, uh, which which I think is obviously a positive indication. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, and final question. Um, it's now been several years since the introduction of the free APM membership, um, and has the effectiveness and benefits to all parties been measured, monitored, analysed and managed? Uh, and in particular here, there's a question about um, conversion to uh, paid for membership. So we've got a bit of data, which I know is quite small on, on the slide here, but when you get the slides, you'll be able to, to look at this properly. But to, if it helps, the green bars here are kind of paid for membership and the orange uh, aspects of those bars are, are the student, the free student membership. So you can see that whilst both of it have increased, obviously the student membership has been increasing at a slightly faster rate. Um, so we now have just under 16,000 student members um, and on average we're getting 30 student members who upgrade to paying membership each month. We do have a dedicated outreach team at APM um, who, are, who are actively looking at this. So that's why we're, we're seeing that increase. And we've got lots of initiatives, things like Project Challenge uh, and so on, which are happening uh, in, with local universities and student members. We're constantly looking, of course, to improve the offering that we have for student members and to increase that conversion. And to support that process, we've actually undertaken some uh, independent research this year to give us greater insights into both the student grade and the associate grade of membership. And we've got some further behavioural research planned for the next financial year. So it's an area we're actively looking at uh, because we, we know that there is more uh, we could we could do in this space. But hopefully that's uh, helpful uh, data there for you to see. Uh, next slide, please. Is that? I believe, Adam, that is the final written submission. Uh, we have had a couple of questions through in the chat, though, if time allows. Yes, and I saw there was one, Matt, about political donations. Can I That's just right. do that one first? I just saw that one come up before. So the question was to do with um, does APM make or receive any political donations? And the answer is uh, no. Um, and the reason we don't is because as well as being a chartered uh, body, we of course are a registered charity, as we mentioned earlier on, and there are quite strict rules around registered charities and the making and, and receiving of political donations. So we don't do that. Um, uh, and in fact, we actually circulated some guidance just last week, I think, from the Charity Commission to that effect. What we do do is have regular engagement 
uh, with uh, uh, political parties and, and that's through, for example, attending party conferences, actually meeting MPs and so on. And that's around how we maximise our impact and raise the profile of the profession. But on donations, no, we don't make or receive uh, any of those. Thank you, Adam. Uh, another question that has come through regarding growth. Does APM have any plans for going global? Um, OK, so uh, I, th I think it's fair to say that the the board uh, of, of APM has always had uh, the, the kind of global opportunities within it, within its uh, mandate. I, I think it, it's also fair to say that there has been a focus on the UK in, in recent years, and that's because we know there are two, more than two million project professionals in the UK. And as you saw earlier on, we're you know, in the region of 40,000 members, uh, the vast majority of which are, are, are in the UK. So there's clearly a lot of uh, growth opportunity within the UK. That said, you also heard me talk about two big international organisations earlier on who are actively looking to work with. So that's obviously part of the plan. You heard uh, the mention earlier on that we want chartership to become the expected global standard. Uh, so global is obviously part of that, that, that mission uh, as well. Um, and lastly, of course, our corporate partners, some of them are themselves multinational organisation. And so it doesn't make a lot of sense to only work with the UK part of some of those organisations. So I think we kind of already are on that pathway to becoming uh, more international and more global. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, one further question. Uh, I don't know if this may be one for our volunteering team, but it's from William Holroyd. Uh, I'm keen to volunteer, but there doesn't appear to be much activity in my branch area, Humber and Yorkshire. Do you have any advice on how I can engage in volunteer activity? I think this is definitely one I'm going to pass over to, to, to Jackie, if, uh, if Jackie's on the line, who, who's our Director of Education and, and Lifelong Learning. Yeah, absolutely, Adam. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, William, thank you for your question. I did note that. Please do um, get in touch with me directly or I'll follow up with you as soon as this call is over. Yes, we'd love you to be involved as a volunteer. Um, and also thank you for raising the point about um, finding out how you can be involved. That is one area that we are incorporating into the review to make it much more uh, clear how, how members can get involved in different volunteering activities. So I'm more than happy to pick this up offline with you after the meeting, but thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, we've had another question come in on the subject of membership fees. Are there any thoughts of reviewed fees for members aged 65 or over? Yeah, and I think I'm going to ask Rebecca to deal with that one, please, because uh, she's uh, our Director of uh, Business Development and Membership. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, hopefully you can see me, but I can't see myself. But anyway, um, yeah, we absolutely do. So there already is a retired rate, which is at 50% of the full membership fee. So anybody that's retired, please do let, you know, all you need to do is contact our service desk and they will apply that 50% rate. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, it's wonderful to see as well. We're getting a lot of interest coming in from people inquiring how they might be able to volunteer in, in their region, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, Jackie, thank you. I can see that you shared your email address there. Um, so uh, we do welcome anyone who is interested in volunteering to contact Jackie directly. Um, there don't appear to be any more further questions coming through in the chat bar. Um, so we can move on to the next agenda item if everyone's happy to do so. Yeah, uh, Matt, uh, Matt, I've just seen a hand going up in the chat. I don't know if that's Tony Whitmore, um, if that was a question. I do apologise, Tony. I didn't have that Sorry, notification Sorry, I think it just came online. in just as you were saying. Oh, no, Tony's just said to ignore that. Uh, apologies. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Lovely. Thanks, Matt. I mean, just some final thoughts for me. The, I'm really struck by the colossal amount of output that's come out of the APM over the year and you now we talk about productivity being low in the UK I think people are looking in the wrong place so well done to Adam the team and all the volunteers as well it's also great that the, the membership is going up really really quickly and that we you know we consider the volunteering side so so important that that golden era for volunteering resonated with me and also I think what we're doing for the APM, with the APM, and then with other people as well, it, it's, it's very rich. So we've got the, the big four, um, the update on CRM, the 50th strategy, the rebrand, that's fantastic. 
Then we've got the impact and external influence that we have. And I know Adam's out and about virtually every day, influencing everyone he can on, on APM. And then the 200 events, two in one year. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. But I think if there was two things that struck me the most, one was he collaborating in the spirit of, of one project profession. I think that is so, so powerful. We will be really considered to be a, a true profession when people see us doing that. Collaboration is the only way to go in my book. And the 110, 100 as well, you know, if we can have 100,000 members by this time next year, that would be absolutely amazing. And our voice will be heard much louder at the table with the other institutions. So, so well done, everyone. And uh, handing over now to Miller for your last thoughts. Thanks very much, Sue. Uh, well, I think what I'll do is I'll just finish with some thanks uh, and I'll start with thanking you all for dialing into this call. I am so, so thrilled to have had so many people joining us for the session. I think we broke 200, uh, which is fantastic, fabulous record for us to have. Um, I'd like to thank you, Sue, for chairing us through this meeting and also Adam, Mark, Mike, um, uh, for preparing for this meeting and then today Matt, Jackie and Rebecca uh, for, for helping us get through uh, the agenda in such a timely way and all of your respective teams. I know everybody's worked really hard this year. I'll just uh, thank all of the people who also stood for election uh, in this year's elections. Uh, this is uh, of such an important part of having a democratic electing election process for our board members. Um, so thank you for taking part. Thank you for standing for election. Um, and please do continue to look for volunteering opportunities with us if you weren't successful. Uh, and do let me know if you'd like to have a chat about that. For those of you who were successful, Amy, Bell, Shalina, um, congratulations. I'm really looking forward to working with you. Um, and I'll just end on uh, thanking Debbie, uh, Debbie Lewis for her support to us uh, over the past few years and for agreeing to continue um, supporting us via the PSNK committee going forward. That's the end of it from me. I'm really glad uh, to have had such a uh, such a meeting today uh, and to have been joined by all of you. Um, I think I've seen a hand go up from you, Sue, or is that just a blip? That, that was my fault, sorry. Blip. Okay, no worries, excellent. Lovely, um, thank you all very much for dialing in today. The recording will be available and the slides will be available. So wish you all the best and have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thanks, take care folks.